All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Athena Yi from the class of 2023, and I'm the 2023 class committee first marshal. Welcome to the fourth real world for recent grads event and the first of 2024. Based on the beloved senior spring event series held over the past several years, Recent World for Recent Grads will bring together recent college graduates across the past 10 classes to learn from each other and discuss relevant real world topics. This virtual event series will be hosted by class leaders in partnership with the Harvard Alumni Association. And today we'll be discussing graduate school. We hope that these are fun, informal and casual for us by us events. We also hope that these can be conversational and not just a lecture. So if you're able to, please have your camera turned on and we welcome your participation in the chat during the opening remarks and feel free to unmute and share anything during the discussion portion at the end. Note that we'll also be recording these sessions to share by email with recent grads after the meeting and we'll also post it on alumni.harvard.edu. Before we kick off, I'll share a bit of background information. The Harvard Alumni Association or HAA it is the official association of all alumni of Harvard University. The HAA maintains and enhances a highly engaged, vibrant community of alumni and friends worldwide. The College Alumni Programs Office of the HAA serves more than 100,000 Harvard and Radcliffe College alumni. The HAA Recent Graduate Engagement Committee, made up of the class committee leadership across the classes, facilitates the meaningful engagement of Harvard College recent graduates with the Harvard alumni community. And now enough from me, we'll hear from our, our speakers. First up is YG Ohashi, AB21, who will speak about doing a PhD program and returning to Harvard after some time away. Take it over, YG. All right, thank you, Athena, and hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to get to speak with you today. Again, my name is Yuri Grace, or YG Ohashi, and I'm currently a clinical science PhD student with the psychology department here. Um, I broadly study stress and mental health among adolescents and young adults, which I find very relevant um, to not only these trying times and this phase of development overall, but also as we're thinking about grad school, it can be a very exciting, but also very stressful and uncertain time. So um, this is kind of, they say research is me search, and it brought me into my passions for psychology, for mental health and bettering the world around us. Um, so a couple things in the few minutes that I have with you all that I want to share. Um, I first wanted to dive in more broadly about the PhD application process itself. So again, I was class of 2021, then went on to complete um, some post-baccalaureate research coordinator position experience, um, working on a National Institute of Mental Health funded R01 study. And that gave me a little bit of time after graduation to get my footing and realize what I was inspired to do, what I was passionate about in research more specifically, and to also gain the skills necessary to make sure that a PhD, which is a very long commitment, you can see in my, my name, it says like uh, class of 2029 question mark, um, that I wanted to make sure that I was fully prepared for that experience and was excited for it, but also had the necessary skills and just like personal um, confidence to go forward. So the PhD application process again, is full of uncertainty. We can all sympathize with it to some extent, um, having gone through the undergraduate application process. And again, you, you cast your net, you're able to kind of dictate whether you want to stay in a certain region, or if you have a certain uh, quality you're really looking for in a principal investigator and mentor, or certain resources you want from a school. And yet, there's only so much we can control. We can put our best foot out there, gain all this experience, um, create the perfect resume and application to um, really highlight who we are. But there's a lot of uncertainty with which programs will ultimately accept us or have positions and places for us or funding to do so. Um, so as I was entering the application process, I wasn't really, you know, dead set on returning to Harvard because I thought it's up in the air whether there are enough spots for um, a student like me, if I'd be the right fit. Um, and I just had my mind open to exploring the world beyond Harvard. But I'm so grateful to have landed back here um, to really just get an enriching experience from being back at Cambridge um, and falling back in love with Harvard through a new lens. 
And that, um, so the first point is really just embrace the PhD application process openly and know that there's a lot of uncertainty, but if you have a, a space in your heart for Harvard, um, it will always welcome you back. Um, the second point I really want to highlight is to take advantage of the resources and opportunities you didn't have time to explore before. So for me, an undergrad, four years, it sounded like such a long time. And then I came to realize, you know, it goes away in the blink of an eye. My class is part of the COVID cohort. So really the uncertain um, aspects of that, you never know um, what, how much time you really have at Harvard. You might take a gap year to um, continue your studies elsewhere and then come back. But there's so many resources, so many different um, student groups and opportunities that are available for all of us to be a part of. Um, that I was excited to then go on and explore further that I didn't have the time to take advantage of during undergrad. So if you are considering continuing your graduate studies at Harvard, whether through a PhD, through medical school, business school, um, whatever it may be, really take a um, kind of an audit of the things that you wanted to do in not only like the Harvard Square area, but in Cambridge and Boston, the people you want to reconnect with, the resources that you want to take advantage of and didn't have the time to before or were fully unaware existed during your four years in undergrad. Um, and then lastly, that brings me to my point of really being deliberate about separating your undergraduate experience from your graduate experience. Um, though it's exciting to come back uh, to Harvard, I was also really concerned about entering this, you know, more senior adult phase of my life, um, trying to not relive my undergraduate years. Maybe for some that would be exciting. And yet at the same time, I think that you're in a whole different mindset when you are in graduate school, trying to explore um, and really build a new, you know, you're starting this new phase of your life, build a new group of friends and a new um, group of experiences that you want to um, take advantage of. So uh, yeah, I would really just be deliberate about setting your boundaries and make sure that you're in a great place um, for yourself to come back and ready to embrace all that Harvard and Cambridge has to offer. And with that, I think I'm around my five minutes, so I'll pass it off back to Athena and thank you so much. Awesome, thank you so much for those remarks, YG. Next up is Ben Schaefer, AB19, who will speak about graduate school outside of the United States. Ben, over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Athena, and thanks, YG. Hi, everybody from very snowy Buffalo, New York. We've gotten three feet of snow here in the past four days, and there's another foot coming tonight. So um, I'm glad to have electricity and bandwidth, uh, literal internet bandwidth, to chat with you all tonight. Um, as Athena said, my name is Ben Schaefer. I was a, a member of the class of 2019, a proud resident of Quincy House, and was a history major. Looks like Jake was also in Quincy House, so I'm glad we have good representation tonight. Um, I'm currently a PhD candidate in American history at Yale, um, but I'm here to talk to all of you tonight about um, going to graduate school abroad and that's based on my experience doing an MPhil in economic and social history at the University of Cambridge uh, the year after I graduated from Harvard and before starting my PhD program at Yale a few years ago. Um, several folks submitted questions about graduate school abroad prior to this, and so I had to look through those and also just thinking through what my pitch has been to my Harvard classmates for the past several years about why you should go abroad, and so have really two uh, points that I want to hone in on uh, tonight. And the first, um, and probably most important for me and for, for lots of other people who end up um, in the UK in particular, but in lots of places, is that there are very few terminal master's degrees in the United States. Um, and that is to say that, um, and Harvard is actually a great example of this, that um, Harvard awards master's degrees for people in graduate school who are getting PhDs, and those degrees come en route to having their PhD, but there's no way to enroll in a master's in history at Harvard outside of being in a PhD program. Um, and that's true in the social sciences and humanities. It's also true in lots of STEM fields, though there are more STEM terminal master's degrees. Um, and so the, the sheer idea of going to graduate school for a short period of time to explore your academic interests is possible in a way outside of the US in a way that it just is not in America. Um, I'm going to offer three links here that I'll put in the chat um, 
just to give you all a sense of the possibility that you have to explore, those are the postgraduate course listings for the University of Cambridge, the University of Oxford, and the University of St. Andrews, which are th three of the top universities in the UK. There are several hundred master's programs that you could enroll in that take a year or two to complete at any of those schools. Um, and it's a really incredible opportunity uh, to, to spend some time diving further into your interests, finding new interests, exploring interests that you've developed um, either in other graduate work at the end of college or in your professional career. And the other thing is, um, along this point, it's a really great taster for graduate school um, and, and for whether you want to go on and uh, do what YG and I have both done and choose to get a PhD or not. Um, which you just can't do um, in most American universities. Uh, and so the second point uh, is really dedicated towards thinking about PhDs in the US versus abroad. And this was something that I thought about while I was applying to PhDs several years ago, and ultimately was making the choice between going to Yale and going back to Cambridge for my own PhD. Um, and the main consideration there is the amount of time that it takes. Um, as, as you heard YG say, PhDs take a really long time in the US. Right now, the average amount of time it takes to get a PhD in America is six years. But because of COVID and many other things, people are taking seven, eight, nine years to finish their degree. Um, in the UK in particular, and in lots of European universities, a PhD takes three years if you're moving quickly and four years if you're moving at a regular pace. And so for people who um, want to move through the degree and go back into the professional world or want to move through the degree and um, teach abroad or have interests that are outside of what's on offer in the US, it's also really important to think about you're only committing four years of your life to the degree rather than six, eight, 10 years to it as well. Um, the, the last thing that I'll say, and this was uh, based off of a question that uh, somebody had submitted, was just about funding for Americans in particular to go abroad to graduate school. And I'll, I'll just say with the 30 seconds that I have left here, taking a look at my timer, there is lots of money available for Americans to go abroad for graduate school. Um, some of that money exists in the pockets of very famous glitzy fellowships that many folks have probably applied to or won or know people who have won that Harvard is really good at racking up. Um, but there are also lots of lots of funding opportunities available at these schools, independent of the major, you know, Rhodes, Marshall, Gates, et cetera, scholarships that we have heard lots about. Those are, and again, I'll just do this quickly because I know I'm hitting my five minutes here. Those are all deadline based and they're all, you know, in various pockets of the university, at the university level, at the department level, or in, you know, Cambridge and Oxford and other places, even within the residential colleges that you'd become affiliated with. And so it's just a matter of exploring um, and doing lots of Google searching and asking questions to people like me and others who you know who've been abroad. It's an incredible experience and I couldn't recommend it highly enough. Um, Athena, back to you. Super compelling, Ben. Thank you so much. Next up is Sina Sedexida, AB21, who will speak about doing an MDMS program and medical school generally. Sina, over to you. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Athena. Thanks, Ben. Athena, I have to say, I'm, I'm quite impressed you got my last name right. <laughs> That's That doesn't happen very common, but... um. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sina. I'm a former uh, Dunster House graduate, class of 21, and currently at Stanford uh, Medical School. I'm doing a joint master's and uh, MD program. Um, you know, I, I want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, and I know, you know, this is this is technically a graduate graduate school panel, so it's so a little bit different. But my experiences in medical school um, you know, have, have been really great so far. I think it's it's one of the degrees that you can kind of get into that has real life, you know, practical implications. You can work with people directly. That's that's why a lot of us, me included, um, get into medicine. And if you're interested in research, there are a lot of opportunities to to pursue that in in medicine right now. And um, and and I think that's that's a growing emphasis that um, people um, in medical school um, and and residency applicant programs have. Um, I think, you know, people who are considering medical school, some of the questions um, are, you know, should we get in straight through or, um, you know, take a couple 
um, years out. I, I went straight through and, and I'm happy that I, that I did that. Um, if uh, my uh, suggestion is if you're um, set on going into medical school, I would recommend you kind of in, to go straight through because it's a long training path. So um, minimum training outside of undergrad is four years medical school and um, a residency program that can take anywhere from you know three to, to eight years. Um, so it, it does help to save up time, some time. And, and you know, there, there are a lot of opportunities uh, in, in medical school um, for you to do the things that you would do in your time off. So, um, for instance, a lot of students are interested in, you know, pursuing MPHs or, or doing global health work. Um, you could do that before med school, but, but there's also a lot of flexibility inside medical school. Um, and uh, I guess just to plug to Stanford, I, um, it's, nothing's, nothing's quite like Harvard. Uh, but, you know, Stanford Medicine uh, keeps everything flexible, too, um, in terms of the curriculum. I, the, the program that I'm in is, is fairly unique. Um, usually med schools are kind of condensing their preclinical curriculum to one year. The program that I'm in is actually three years preclinical and uh, gives us uh, some time to do longitudinal research in the same time, something some wet lab research, um, uh, neuroscience research uh, uh, at the same time. And um, we'll be also taking an additional um, year out uh, for this master's degree, which is also a research master's degree. And uh, this program actually funds the last four years of medical school and, and gives you the, um, the MD-PhD stipend that you would get, um, you know, if you're enrolled in an MD-PhD program. So um, there are opportunities like this for financial um, uh, sort of support and, um, you know, research if, if folks are interested. But um, yeah, I'm not going to get into too much detail because I, I don't know what the, the crowd is looking for. I'm, I will put down my email in the chat. Um, I'm, I'm always happy to, you know, talk to anyone who's, who's in the process, who's considering, um, or uh, sort of anywhere in between. So if you have any specific questions, um, yeah, feel free to just shoot me an email. Awesome. Thanks so much, Sina. That was awesome. All right, so next up we have Liz Hovland, AB22, who will speak about doing graduate school part-time while working full-time. Liz, over to you. Thanks, Athena. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Liz. Um, I graduated in the class of 2022. I was a joint concentrator in his and UGS with a secondary in Gov, um, and I'm currently working on Masters of Library and Information Science at Simmons University while working full-time as the social media manager at Wellesley College. So I'm doing a lot of different things with multiple universities and I thought that it would be the best to just do a quick timeline from May, 2022 to today, but with tips and hints sprinkled throughout based on questions submitted beforehand, as well as things that I didn't specifically learn from Harvard um, and things that I have found very helpful. So. Uh, flashback to July 2022, I'd applied to over 100 jobs. I didn't have anything. I finally had an offer that I wasn't super happy about, but I knew would pay for grad school because that's the perks of working at a higher education institution, especially Harvard. If you work at Harvard for, I believe it is two years, they will pay for you to get a graduate degree if you can prove that it will help your specific job. Um, and all you need is a manager to like sign up on that. Um, so basically, I worked full time as um, an undergrad, I ran social media for Harvard. And at, when I did that, they counted that in my time. So when I started working, I already had four years of tenure. So starting at my job, I was able to get my grad school paid for. I was super excited. I did not want to go to grad school. But all of a sudden, this opportunity was handed to me. And I felt like I kind of had to do it. Um, I fell in love with archives and being and research and being in libraries while I was doing my thesis, but I really didn't want to do a history PhD because I did not want to spend six plus years studying. Um, and I didn't really want to be an academic. Um, but I really liked the idea of working in archives or libraries. And from what I've learned, what I learned, uh, in those 100 plus job applications is you need a master's in library or information sciences to do anything in libraries. Um, I got rejected from jobs at the Cambridge public library that were $16 an hour because I didn't have a master's. Um, and that was heartbreaking. So 
from what I learned was I need to get a, some sort of master's degree. Um, and how can I do this while still, you know, living? I live in Cambridge. It's not exactly cheap. Um, I am working full time. How do I do this? So I found out that Simmons, which is actually one of the number one schools in the country for library and information science, based right here in Boston, um, has a fully remote library and information science program. Um, they also have a hybrid and real life program, but I chose the fully remote option. Um, and you can do this as slow as one class at a time. So I was able to take only one class my fall semester, um, which was helpful payment wise because I only had to pay for one class at a time. Um, and now I'm in two classes this spring semester um, while still working technically 40 hours a week. Um, but I'm going to get to how I get away with all that in a second. Um, so uh, I got into Simmons in spring 2023, and I actually got a pretty nice merit scholarship, which I didn't think I was going to get. I did not have a 4.0. I, my grades were fine, but like not great. Um, and yet I got like 25% off my entire degree, um, which was pretty cool. Um, so my degree actually, I think it was like 35% off. So my degree went from like 30 K to 20 K, which still seems like a lot, but broken up into, uh, like I think it's 12 classes. You can see how like a, with a payment plan, you can make it happen. Um, so another, uh, little hint is to fill out the supplemental scholarship material just in case. I didn't think I was going to get a merit scholarship, but I like checked the box that I was interested and I got like money off. So highly suggest that. Um, it's way easier to apply to grad school than to apply to undergrad. Um, you are applying for the program you're interested in and that's it. I only applied to Simmons and I got the Simmons. Um, but I also had a very strong feeling I was going to get in because they're not known for rejecting a lot of people. It's not like I wasn't applying to Harvard again. So that was also really helpful. Um, which kind of brings me back to an earlier point. So I mentioned that Harvard was paying for my degree, but I also mentioned that I'm not working at Harvard anymore. And that is because I left Harvard um, unexpectedly and started working at Wellesley College, which I absolutely love. Um, but now my master's degree is not getting paid for. Um, so the entire reason I decided to do a master's is no longer the case. However, I'm still doing it. I love it. Um, luckily, I split rent with my partner um, and you know we're making it work. Um, but I specifically knew that like when I was transitioning jobs that I needed what I like to call a chill girl job, which is a job where you can work from home two to three days a week and your manager is understanding and like is super like passionate about work from home and work-life balance and understanding that, you know, maybe you have to do a 60 hour field internship one semester. And so this semester I have to do that, but my manager is more than okay with me taking five hours a week to go work in the Wellesley College archives. Um, I didn't think I would ever have a job that that was, was that flexible. But like, again, I'm not a consultant. I don't work in finance. I run social media for uh, Historically Women's College. It's not super high stakes. Um, and to be honest, I spend a lot of my working hours doing readings and watching lectures. Um, but that's I get my job, work done and I have a thumbs up for my manager. So I highly suggest like trying to find a job that's very understanding. Um, I will say um, to wrap it up, I do want to have a couple issues with part time, like doing a degree part time. It takes a lot longer. This is in theory a two degree program. It's going to take me three or four years. Um, so, you know, that's definitely I can't get into the library science workforce for another three to four years. Um, you also don't really have much of a community. Like, even though Simmons is in Boston, I don't go to campus ever. I've only ever been to campus like twice. Um, and most people, most of my classmates aren't in Massachusetts. So even if I wanted to meet up with them, you know, you can't necessarily do that. Um, it's also a lot of work. I'm not going to lie. Um, the, my time management skills that I learned and, uh, like honed at Harvard are the most important thing that I learned because, Google Calendar is your best friend. And I have been preaching that since my freshman year at Harvard. I still am preaching that. Um, it's all about, you know, work-life balance. But when you also have school in there, you got to balance it. But it really helps when you have a good support system and an understanding manager. Um, but I will put my email in the chat as well. Happy to talk specifics uh, about Wellesley Simmons or any of this. So thank you. Thanks so much, Liz. You sound like a superwoman out there juggling all of that.
Um, all right, so next up is Gabriella Rivero, AB21, who will speak about doing a JD LLM program and law school generally. Gabriella, over to you. Hi guys, um, I'm Gabby Rivero. Thanks for the intro, Athena. Um, I am getting my JD LLM in international law at the University of Miami School of Law. Um, at Harvard, I concentrated in sociology with a minor in Latinx studies um, and got a couple of certificates here and there. Um, and basically, I went straight through to law school. Um, I knew that it was something that I wanted to do since even before I got to college. Um, I had a couple advisors at Harvard who helped me apply since I applied my senior year, which was also during the pandemic. So that was super fun. Um, and I would agree with what Liz said. I think in my experience, at least applying to grad school, applying to law school was a lot easier than applying to college. Um, the one essay I had to write for all of the law schools I applied to was why do you want to go to law school and why do you want to go to law school now? And that was it. Maybe like a diversity statement if um, I wanted to include a little more information about myself. Um, and so I got a full tuition scholarship to UM um, for public interest law. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of scholarships you can apply to for law school. Um, there's merit scholarships. There are um, a lot for public interest since it is kind of an under, under recruiting part of law. Um, and then, you know, if you're interested in all kinds of other things or if you, there are lots of like identity based scholarships as well. Um, and so I was just lucky enough to get one because I want to do immigration law. Um, and I absolutely love the program at UM. Um, I was also lucky enough this scholarship allowed me to get my LLM, which is a master of laws, um, because my scholarship would pay for it if I did it concurrently with the JD. Um, but even if you don't, uh, have a deal like that. Um, you can usually for like an extra year, an extra semester or two, um, get a master's of law as well. Um, it's not the most uh, relevant thing. You don't need it to be a practicing attorney, but um, a lot of like firms or especially if you're going to do a clerkship with a judge after law school, um, it just kind of like looks good to have that extra degree. So if you have the opportunity and your school has a program in an area that you're interested in, um, I would also recommend that. Um, and yeah, I also am not like quite sure what people want to hear about, but I can talk about like experiential opportunities in law school. I was in clinics. Um, I worked with the immigration clinic at Harvard actually before I applied to law school myself. Um, that's a really great way to get hands-on experience because you're working with real clients um, and being supervised by an attorney. Um, and yeah, like any other kind of law school life, I'll put my email in the chat as well, but I hope you all have questions because I love talking about this. Thanks so much, Gabriella. That sounds awesome. All right, so our final speaker is Jake Stepanski, AB17 and EdM21, who will speak about doing a Master's of Education program and the transition from college to working and then back to school. Jake, over to you. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Jake Stepanski. I, in addition to various roles at various arts nonprofits um, of different kinds, I'm also working right now to lead a team of over 50 queer and trans artists, educators, organizers, librarians, and community leaders to build the QT Library, a brick and mortar LGBTQ plus library and sober community space coming to Boston this year. Um, I'm taking a little more philosophical approach to all this, so I appreciate you going on a little journey with me. Um, I graduated from Harvard College in 2017 with a degree in psychology and a minor in theater, dance, and media. Um, when I was a junior, I found out about the arts and education master's program at the Harvard Grad School of Education. I had friends who were doing the program and loved it. And I'd been studying education and art making separately. And I was like so excited about the possibility of doing a program that lived at the intersection of my interests. Now, my senior year of college was 2016, 2017. The world was waking up to the reality of a Trump presidency and all the ch challenge and danger that it would unlock or make visible. And like many artists at the time, I was sitting with a lot of big questions about what is the point of any of this, of our work in the face of so much uh, darkness and how should we be showing up for the world? Um, and I remember feeling like, hey, I'm graduating from one of the most powerful institutions in the world with a degree that by design opens doors. 
Um, and in this moment, I can either use that key, that immense privilege to like help myself, or I can use it to like try and make the world a better place. Um, and part of me too was also thinking like, you can't go to grad school, doing a master's in arts and education sounds really fun. That'd make you really happy. Nobody's happy right now. You haven't earned that. Like get back to me when you've single-handedly solved the climate crisis. And then you can apply for that little program at Hugsy and take a year for yourself to like do some fun learning. Um, this was, I think, some very convoluted thinking on my part. I was 22 and still very dumb, uh, but I decided not to apply. I ended up moving to Texas and working for a really, really beautiful company called Forklift Danceworks, which is a dance company that makes dances with trash collectors and firefighters and lifeguards and other folks who do not think of themselves as dancers. And I have no regrets, but what I think was really uh, beautiful and formative about taking that leap and moving to Austin, a city where I knew absolutely no one, and working with a company that really intentionally worked as artists across all kinds of different structures of societies. So we're working with like city employees and uh, government officials and community members of all kinds and elders and youth um, was that it was a crash course in the fact that Harvard is an absolutely bizarre microcosm of the world, like so many quote unquote elite universities. And you actually have to claw your way out of that bubble. You have to make the active choice to claw your way out of that bubble. Um, that it is, or at least that it was when I was an undergrad. Um, and I think, frankly, that that is the most important thing that you can do, period, before heading back to your school. If you've gone as an undergrad to Harvard, like, learn that nothing in the world is like Harvard. Um, I loved working at Forklift, but two things happened that led me to apply to the master's program. Um, the first was that I realized that I had sort of hit a ceiling with my professional role there. Um, and the second thing is that they announced that the next year would be the last year of this program that I had wanted to do for a really long time. They were canceled, they were changing and canceling the program basically. Um, and I realized that everyone has a place in the great fight to save the world from itself and from humanity. Uh, and sometimes you need a bit of course correcting or nurturing or whatever um, to get there. And if grad school is the pathway that will get you there, then that is a beautiful thing as well. Um, I graduated from Hugsy with an EDM in arts and education in 2021. You'll notice that this means that I went right at the start of COVID entirely on Zoom. I actually got my acceptance letter uh, in the morning. And then uh, that night we went into full COVID lockdown. Um, and if there's one thing that I learned from going to grad school on Zoom, it's that um, grad school, or at least a master's degree, or at least the master's degree that I got, um, is an immense, immense luxury. Um, and I think it's also important to name, just for context for my remarks, is just that I went to grad school for basically free because I got one of the um, like public service fellowships that Harvard offers, the Fortzheimer Fellowship. But initially, when I saw my financial aid offer, I was like, awesome, not going to grad school. So cool. Thank you for um, this bill that I can't pay. Um, all of this is to say that my like big top final thought points are, um, first of all, in theory, grad school is an investment that you're making now in order to secure a higher salary or job later. And my big thing that I would say first is like research. If that's true, the world is very different than it was even 10 years ago in terms of how salaries are evolving, um, how roles are being parceled, parceled out, how money is being parceled out in this world. Um, check, like do a job search now. Um, and see if in your specific field, uh, having a master's degree would actually lead to an increased salary. Um, the second thing is like, do as much homework as you can to know exactly what your potential grad program is. Like literally, what are you doing every single day? Um, so much of my master's program was uh, reading a little bit and then thinking really hard and then writing some reflections about it. Um, that's a beautiful thing. I think for a lot of my peers who were paying $60,000 to sit on Zoom and read a little bit and think, um, there was they had a lot of questions and frustrations about um, where their time and energy and money was going. Um, two other quick thoughts are if you are going to grad school at Harvard, you are 1000% going to wanna to take classes across schools. Um, the world is big. If you are at a school that allows you to expand beyond your, your specific focus, cannot recommend it enough. That is maybe my biased opinion as more of a generalist than a specialist, but um, 
take advantage of it if you can. Um, and the last thing I would say is figure out what your unique angle into your grad school experience is. Like, why are you doing your very specific program? And don't be afraid to apply if you think you bring a unique um, angle to your cohort. And when you're thinking about your recommenders, it doesn't have to be your college professor who is a specialist in that field. It could be someone who you worked with, who is really great at one other facet of the work of the world um, and can point out how you, as a person who does that kind of work in the world, um, would be a unique and stellar candidate for that program. Um, the QT library, which I work for and I'm building in this world, is a project that came about because I and two of my friends from grad school got on a Zoom one day and were like dreaming about how we can make the world a better place. So it is a huge pitch to do grad school, but just like know what you're getting into and whether you can live um, the life that you need to, want to, or have to live um, while you are doing it at the same time. I'll put my email in the chat. Ask me any and all questions. Thanks for being here. What beautiful remarks. Thank you so much, Jake. Now for the rest of our time, we'll open it up to Q&A discussion and sharing of resources. We also welcome sharing of any resource links in the chat. Please use the raise hand function on Zoom and we'll call on you. And perhaps to kick us off for the sake of those watching the recording of this, Ben, would you mind briefly speaking to the question that was asked of you in the chat before? Yes, absolutely. So I don't I don't think that the people on Zoom recordings can see the question in the chat. So maybe it's helpful to just read that. Um, Sophie had asked if there were any good work opportunities in U.S. universities for folks with an international terminal degree. Um, and I said, yes, um, I think you could go around the staffs of uh, Harvard or lots of other universities all over the country and find people, um, administrators uh, and other folks with degrees from all over the world, um, you know, doing really great work. And then in terms of uh, teaching positions to uh, lots of people with um, international PhDs um, end up teaching at Harvard and also all of the other great universities in this country that aren't Harvard, but nevertheless do really important work. Um, and so, I mean, the biggest thing, I guess I will just note on the, on the teaching question, if you're interested in getting an international PhD and then coming back into academia in the U.S., um, is that frequently there is some skepticism because one of the parts of, one of the reasons why um, international PhDs are shorter is because you don't have to do any coursework and you're not required to perform the labor of being a teaching fellow in the same way that you are in the American system. And so if, um, if you want to get a PhD abroad, you just need to search out teaching opportunities for yourself while you're doing that PhD so that you can show whatever school that you're applying to teach at in the U.S. that you do have teaching experience and are very excited to do it. Thank you, Ben. We have a question in the chat for anyone. If you could talk about putting together a grad school application if you've been out of school for maybe three to four years or more, did you get recommendations from your undergraduate professor professors despite that age gap? What did that process look like for you? Gabrielle, you want to go first? Sure. Um, so I did go straight through, but I know from talking to a lot of administrators and also people who didn't go straight through um, from undergrad to law school, at least, that uh, you can reach back out to your professors, especially if you did have a really close relationship with them in undergrad and if um, whatever they teach is relevant to what you're applying for. Um, but I do know that uh, most law schools are pretty understanding that if you've been out of school for a while and um, you probably have more professional connections rather than um, connections to professors or other people at your university. And actually they would prefer to see at least a couple recommendations from past or current employers because uh, those people know who you are now probably better um, and can speak to other like transferable skills to whatever grad school you're applying, like your work ethic, your punctuality, your professionalism in the office, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, and if you're going to reach back out to your professor, usually just like a short 
email intro. It's been so long. I miss you. Let's grab coffee or talk on Zoom is like a pretty good way to get in there and then catch them up and ask them for a recommendation. There's another question about applying to graduate school at an older age. And Annie, thank you for saying older and not old. Um, so maybe if, if anyone here can't speak to this specifically, maybe you know other people that are part of your programs or know other contacts that could share what that experience was like. Uh, Liz? So I'm actually like in the minority of being a young person in my cohort. Um, most people in my, at least in my classes, are have multiple master's degrees. Um, have one, have two. There's a couple who have PhDs who are just going back and doing something else. Um, there are some people who went to college 20 years ago and now realize they want to do this and that they need a degree for it. Um, and there's also surprisingly like a couple like undergrads who are taking some classes for fun. Um, so I've noticed that at least when it comes to camaraderie and um, like being... I know when you say being accepted into a program, I assume you mean like actually being accepted, um, but like being accepted personally and like with your group of cohorts and like your group of people, it's also very important. Um, and that's, there's, I've seen no issue with any sort of age, age gap at all. Um, so it's, that's why I know. I would second that and just say, especially in, I, I don't know what, kinds of programs that you're um, looking for, but at least in the program that I was, and I would say like the entirety of um, at least the ed school, like so much of what grad school is in practice is it's a bunch of people who got together, read the same like six pages and then reflected on it based on their life experience. And like for anybody to hear that from anybody else, that's really cool. Um, so, uh, yeah, just seconding, like it, we had, especially in my COVID year, we had like people who were like, I can finally do it. Cause it's on zoom, um, much, like much, much beloved, uh, if you can make it work for you for sure. Huge plus. Yeah. <clears throat> Just also wanted to, to basically second what everyone said. I think that's especially the case in, in the medical uh, school programs, just because of the preparation that usually takes folks to, to kind of get to a stage um, you, uh, that um, you'd be applying. But, but we have, you know, people in their 30s, 40s with families, you know, kids as part of the program. And, you know, they're pretty accepted as part of the class. In fact, a lot of, you know, students kind of get a little bit of a sort of more mentorship um, uh, type relationship um, uh, out of it. So, so it, it, uh, yeah, I, I think in, in the medical context, there's, there's going to be no trouble fitting in. And, and I'll just chime in too, on the PhD context, um, the, the Yale history PhD program is about 150 people in it in any given time. And the, the age range is from 22 to um, late 40s right now in terms of the people in the various stages of the degree. Um, I would say that there's actually some benefit to uh, having some life experience as an adult and and like knowing how to do everything from like cook a good meal or like have people over for dinner or um, like do your laundry or like pay rent or get insurance and other things that like it's just like a lot harder when you're 22 to figure all that out for the first time than when you're uh, in your late 20s or 30s or wherever you are in the in the process. And I think in particular in, in the PhD world, um, age is not a qualifying factor for getting into a program. It's the passion for the ideas that you have and that you want to pursue and the research that you want to conduct. And then you're fit within a program. So for some people that have those ideas crystallize when they're 19 or 20 and feel really confident applying as seniors in college. And for other people, it takes several years or several decades to happen. And there's there's no wrong time uh, to hop into that process. Thank you all. I think we have time for probably one more question if anybody has anything they want to ask.
If not, Athena, I'll turn it over to you to close this out. Cool. Thank you again to all of our speakers, YG, Ben, Sina, Liz, Gabriella, and Jake, and all of our participants today. Our fifth Real World for Recent Grads event will be next month, and we'll be discussing job and career changes. Email invitations will follow, and thank you all again. Bye. Thank you all. All panelists and organizers.